footy is in full swing, and at Betfair, we believe bigger is better. Believe the Blues are bolters? Back Carlton for the top four. Tigers ready to roar? Find better odds on Richmond. Gamble responsibly. If gambling becomes an issue for you, call 1-800-858-858. Is coming in gold and a world record. Ian Thorpe, the birth of a legend. 458 is the total, out of which Bradman has made 309 not out. It's a world's record. First ball in Test cricket in England for Shane Warne. And he's done it. He started off with the most beautiful delivery. To this is your sporting life for Tobin Brothers Funerals, celebrating lives. Here's your host, Sam Edmund. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. As always, we're here for our friends at Tobin Brothers Funerals, celebrating lives. Well, today we're joined by a man who was overlooked in two years' worth of AFL drafts, only to emerge from the waffle and later. Stunned the footy world by winning the 2000 Brownlow medal. Shane Wowoden played 138 games for Melbourne and, after a bombshell trade, another 62 for Collingwood as a durable, blonde-haired midfielder with a booming left foot. His was an AFL career that burned bright early, but unfortunately ended while he was still in his 20s. Shane, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. Good morning, guys. How are you? My pleasure. Great to be with you. Now, where do we find you? You're back home. You're back in Perth. Yeah, been back here now in Perth for only five years after I left Brisbane. Uh, brought the family back um, here. Uh, a fresh winter now this year. Probably the first time in a very long time we've been uh, been wet just as much as what you guys are in Melbourne. So, um, yeah, no, enjoying life here in Western Australia. Uh, a bit more relaxed and looking after the fam. So at the uh, the ripe old age of 45, how do you, Shane, look back on your career? I mean, it wasn't an easy path to the AFL, which we'll get to in a moment, and it probably wasn't the easiest finish either, but I suppose they really are. But in between, there's a lot to hold dear and remember fondly. How does it sit with you now? Oh, absolutely. And uh, fond memories. Um, we all like to play forever, I think. Um, I still miss the game now, even though uh, I've been out for a very long time. Um, I certainly, um, like most kids, it's uh, not an easy pathway Got with going through the draft and obviously missed a couple. Um, and at the back end, as you said, not a, uh, a great way to finish. Obviously, would have done at 29, would have loved to have played, you know, three or four more years and, and maybe get 40 or 50 more games in, but it wasn't to be. But looking back now and reflecting, oh, at a wonderful time, great journey, two fantastic and proud Victoria clubs I was involved with. Met a lot of mates along the way and got to do something I, I dreamt of as a young kid and enjoy so uh, I had no regrets no regrets at all. No, well said and let's go back before we go forward then for a moment what what was childhood like Shane out west and what was your heritage, Ukrainian heritage isn't it? Yes, Ukrainian from my father's side, um, his parents uh, came out here on the boat decades ago based themselves in Geraldton and that's where I was born, uh, just four hours north of Perth, um, lived there for the first ten years of my life and then um, through a se- mum and dad were separated so we ended up moving to Perth and uh, more opportunity and um, it was probably good for my schooling and good for my footy um, and you know just went through the pathways here and found myself at East Romantle and went through that pathway and, um, which was a great footy club back in the early to mid 90s Ken Judge and Tony McCall led an unbelievable footy club here um, and uh, through discipline and hard work which I had learnt very early days what it was going to take and look it didn't happened for me early as an 18 year old and I wasn't ready probably just a little bit underdeveloped and not quite ready for AFL footy but got the opportunity at 20 years of age and um it, it was an invite really only for possibly the rookie draft because that was the first year mm. in 97 of the rookie draft so I took the opportunity to go across and train with the club for two months and um did enough to um for them to warrant a spot on the list and didn't get on the rookie list was put straight on the primary list so yeah very fortunate very excited and it was the start of a um I was hoping a long-term journey yeah so as a teenager as you touched on you played for East Fremantle in the, in the waffle against men but as we t- just touched on so overlooked in the 95 draft 96 draft which must have hurt and then it all happens very quickly I mean when did the call come from Melbourne I'd had a couple of conversations um, leading into the 96 draft I'd caught up with Melbourne and Hawthorne um, they were the two clubs that I'd spoken to and showed the most interest I didn't speak to anyone else um, and the draft didn't happen so I effectively got a call straight after the draft to say that we'd like to get you over mm. um, in October for the pre-season period um, and there were a few issues which I actually didn't know what was going on so I didn't end up going over to uh, 
uh, first week of January of 97. Back in those days, the pre-season draft was held pretty much on the eve of the footy season. Yeah. So in February. So um, I had the opportunity, as, as much as frustrating it was not to get over it in that pre-Christmas period, trained with East Fremantle and then um, went across and did the post-Christmas um, block with Melbourne back at the Junction Oval and had that for two months and just had to give it everything. I had two months to show what I could do both on the field and off and be in the coach's pockets, <laughs> learn as much as I can, train as hard as I can and fingers crossed. Uh, I think we had 15 invitees train with us that first pre-season um, and they had three pre-season list spots so I just tried to grab one of them. Yeah, so you obviously make the impression because you're taking a pick 18 in the 97 pre-season draft. What were your early impressions of life over here I mean how did you settle in and I imagine you must have ruffled some feathers there with some of the elder statesmen coming back in for a long pre-season and here's this whippersnapper from the west fighting and scrapping for any sort of opportunity he can get yeah uh, I was introduced to the group um, with a couple of other West Australians that I went across with too so um, I was certainly uh, I've always wanted to play in Victoria I I was really um, had the impression that I just wanted to be in the heartland of it all and the mecca of it to religion in Victoria and I felt AFL footy was, and for me, the best opportunity was to play over there. So leaving home at 20 years of age, I was so excited for, and, um, you know, I was in the locker room with Gary Lyon, Todd Viney, Jimmy Stein, Stephen Tingay, I love it. It was was inspiring for me. It was a proud football club led by Neil Baum and wanted to give it the best shot I could, and um, I was very fortunate. I had a really good practice game against Richmond in the twos, I think it was, out at Waverley, and I think I'd only played a quarter and did a little bit of work in that first quarter to probably warrant enough. Uh, But I think it wasn't just what I did there. It was more the off-field stuff too and um, the extras, the educational, the learning. Again, as I said, knocking on coaches' doors to be the best I possibly could. I had two months to it and I had one crack at it and um, I felt that was going to be probably my last opportunity. Did you drive Barmy nuts? How did you get on with the big fella? I loved Barmy. He was a fantastic coach. Very good at what he did. Great people person. Good good manager of men. Knew a little bit about the game too. So, uh, But also, you're learning off the senior players and what they did, you know. The resources weren't around as what they are today in terms of an educational point of view, but um, senior players is, and assistant coaches and more the experienced heads where is where I did my education. It is incredible to think, though, isn't it, Shane, that you get overlooked for the second time in a national draft. You go over there with, uh, with what, uh, a two-month audition, and the end, then you get picked up and you go on to play not just a few games. You play every game in your 97 debut season. In fact, you play more than 100 consecutive games straight off the debut. So what was driving you at this point? I imagine the motivation was through the roof after being overlooked a couple of times as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I always felt as a young kid and um, you know, leading for, into early stages of my AFL career that um, commitment and staying dedicated to the cause and um, believing in yourself was always a strength of mine and um, doing the hard work because I love training. So doing the hard work and one, doing something you love, but also being committed because it's your dream. It's something you want to do. So striving to be the best you can I felt was one of my strengths. So and I still had to, I still had a lot to learn within the game and how I play and what I needed to do and build my craft. But the, the commitment levels was, was never a question I felt. You're listening to This Is Your Sporting Life. Thanks to Tobin Brothers Funerals, a family-owned business since 1934. Big things were to come for Shane Wowoden, who did become famous for his fastidious attention to dietary detail. We'll weigh in that right after this. You're listening to This Is Your Sporting Life with Sam Edmund for Tobin Brothers Funerals, celebrating lives. Welcome back to This Is Your Sporting Life for Tobin Brothers Funerals, celebrating lives. Hello, great to have your company on This Is Your Sporting Life, made possible by Tobin Brothers Funerals Celebrating Lives. We're with the Brownlow medalist, Shane Wywoden. Shane, you were well known for your professionalism and your preparation, and that's centred on what you ate. How far did you go when it came to your diet? Um, yeah, so, so the end of the 99 season, my third year in the AFL, I had to ask myself a few questions, and I think I, I came runner-up in the BNF. To David Schwartz at Melbourne and I still had questions on my body and how I felt um, throughout a game during quarters while I was fatiguing you know early stages of games and early parts of the quarter so I felt there was another level to be able to go to I remember having a dinner with all the midfielders at the end of 99 season with uh, um, Todd Viney at his house and he introduced us um, to a guy who is a, a biochemist um, and it was an, an, just another level. So we all bought in and um, invested our time and efforts to 
get in there and see what he had to say and what he was good at, where he could possibly take us as a group. And um, I was the one that went with him and decided to do the work. And it was really clear at the start that if you're in, you're in and you're invested. There's, I'm not stuffing around. Don't waste my time. I don't want to waste your time. So I said, no, mate, I'm in. And um, so, yeah, it was ripping it all back, stripping everything that I ate. Um, so at the end of the day, and to cut a short story, uh, it, it was more about um, not necessarily volumes, but times I had to eat, mm. what I, yeah, to the gram, to the mill. Um, very fastidious as to uh, when and how and at a training um, to the levels where my diet was cut in half, but it was more around um, the timings, really, and the weights of it all. So it was very particular. Um, so that's the nutritional advice. And there was obviously the bloods that needed to be taken. Um, and a few other things, just to, from a scientific background, really, just to see where your levels are at and how you're managing yourself. And then it's what you're doing there with your preparation and your physical activity just to be able to manage and complement it all. So, so Shane, what is the best time of the day to, to, to eat as a professional athlete? <laughs> uh, that's it's a very individual thing for everybody, really. Um, it's probably more the mills and grams that it came down to for me, but... Um, each individual is very different. It's, it worked for some. I even spoke to a few um, um, players from other clubs who had worked with Shane a little bit, um, and it wasn't for them, and it didn't work for them. Um, but for me, I just felt it was my edge. Um, it's you know, a lot of it is, is about the, the, the mental side of the game, so yeah. it could be a little bit of that too with it all. Um, Any strange timings felt- though, Shane? You didn't have to wake yourself up at four to consume half a roast chook or anything like that. No, no, not at all. No, no not the time is at all. The sleep was really important, so the recovery side of things uh, stayed the same. But, yep. uh, you know, really in particular about when you do it after your training and how long after each session and, um, and time is. But it got to the point where um, it worked for me. And um, so then, yeah, a lot of, a lot, a lot of, the, a lot of the ingredients in, in foods were stripped out of my diet and um, a bit of caffeine for the hit was placed in it. Uh, so, yeah, it was very particular. It worked for me. I felt really good game day, which was what it was for. Um, um, I felt my adrenaline level and uh, at the back end of games was wearing thin about 10 minutes to go. But the, the, all the questions I was asking pre the season um, was answered and I felt like I could run out games a bit better and feel, um, feel more comfortable, particularly early in games when the game's hot. Mm. and you needed a second wind and you had the more energy, that's when I felt like I needed the most. We touched on Neil Barmer, who was obviously your first coach. He was sacked mid-season. I mean, I imagine that's an eye-opener um, as a youngster coming into the system. Oh, absolutely. I, I think it was all at the back end of round 10, maybe. I think we were playing St Kilda at Waverley and on Triple M, maybe, uh, or on mm. radio. I'm not sure which station it was, but on radio, I think Joseph Goodnick, the president at the time, yeah, had said it. I could be wrong. No, that's right. That's what I recall. So, that's right. Yeah, so yeah. post-game, that's when we found out that um, our coach had been sacked, which we weren't travelling that well at the time. It wasn't nothing to do with Neil Barmer. Was our performance was horrendous. We weren't particularly performing well at all. But, yeah, that's how we found out as a playing group. And then um, and then Hutchie took over to the back end of 97. Yep. And then another Neil took the job in 98, Neil Danaher, of course. So what were your first impressions of him? Um, this will be interesting. He, uh, he took us back to school. I think we did our first pre-season at Caulfield Grammar, and we stripped it right back. So our game plan and um, and studying and knowledge of how we wanted to play was all back in the classroom at Caulfield Grammar. Um, he wanted to teach us um, the game and how it was played, and he felt it's you're either, you're either in offense or defense, um, which I learned. Um, pretty quickly too, which I've taken a little bit back into my coaching now. And um, he, he was terrific. He was harsh. He was fair. I, I think one of our first pre-season games was against Sydney in New Zealand at the Basin Reserve. Mm. Um, and it was the first time we really heard Danners give a spray. He gave David Neat an almighty spray at half time, And I think we were in an Nantes Cup game. It was, a, it was a pre-season game, but we knew we had something pretty special here. But um, yeah, harsh, fair, very knowledgeable. Um, that took us to the nearly to the the summit 
in his first year, we were, we were very unlucky. We thought in 98, we, we mm. felt that was the year that um, we, we could have won it. Yeah, well, that was the prelim final, wasn't it? Uh, you lose to North Melbourne. Yeah, different final system back then too. Uh, we lost to North Melbourne. I think Shannon Grant kicked five in the prelim and um, that sunk us, but we'd beaten Adelaide and St Kilda in the first two finals and you win two finals, now you're in a grand final after finishing top four as well. Yeah. So oh, we certainly stormed home in the back end of 98 to finish the home and away and then felt like we were in good nick. We had all our senior players up and playing. It would have been great for them to be finishing on that note. Um, but yeah, we we stumbled at the final hurdle. So 98, as you say, was your second season. It was Neil Danaher's first. So you showed some natural improvement. In fact, you kicked an incredible goal against Port Adelaide at the MCG. I can still hear Peter Landy in the commentary box. Still Wo Woden, still Wo Woden. That, that, you must treasure that moment fondly. Oh, absolutely. Um, oh, you, you, don't, you don't get to see that much space in, them, in a footy field, do you? With, <laughs> particularly through the midfield anyway with... Now the 60-metre bubble, that is, um, what, AFL 40 years. But, oh, certainly, uh, yeah, one of those things that just opened up and the seas parted and, and, and away you went. Um, certainly teammates looked after you along the way through it. Uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, just lucky enough to finish it uh, at the end of the day. So all that hard work uh, meant for something. Uh, it? Yeah, yeah. Great. It, was, it, it was awesome, Neil. Danners was, uh, was terrific uh, in that first year. And uh, we certainly... We certainly learnt a lot as a team, and um, we didn't. We weren't able to capitalise on the following year in '99. But uh, he was a wonderful coach, and that was an incredible goal of yours against Port Adelaide. But it, in fact, it wasn't even goal of the year, though, was it? And you can blame one of your teammates for that, can't you? Yeah, uh, round 13, the whiz broke my heart and pushed <laughs> one at Waverley against the Hawks. And That's right. I remember there was a show called Live and Kicking. Uh, and we were invited to that. And I, I walked up there, you know, thinking that the goal of the year is yours. And then, but I knew my teammate was going to be there at about. So anyway, he rocked up also. So I thought, <laughs> well, hang on, he might have mark of the year here. Uh, but no, he, he picked me on the post and um, he got the vote. So I thought that was an incredible goal at Waverley um, under a bit of duress from opposition and kicked a barrel from 60 that did a Tim May special and rolled in. <laughs> That's so, right. That's uh, right. After about yeah. three given goes, I think, on, on route. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a fantastic goal. An unbelievable player. He was spectacular, wasn't he, in what he was able to do. And um, we missed him when he went to Fremantle. Yeah. And just before we get to the break, Shane, you touched on it just before, but uh, you get to the club in 97, it's Wooden Spoon. 98 um, was fourth on the ladder. 99, 14th. 2003rd, playing off in a grand final. 2001, back down to 11th. 2002, back up to sixth. It was some sort of roller coaster over your time at the Demons. It became almost the annual gag, whether it was an on year or an off year. You could tell by the, the season that it was. Oh, absolutely. It. Uh... Everyone was asking the question every year, and I think even after I retired, we could always uh, um, ask the question. But we had no idea; we couldn't put it down to anything really. Um, you know, we'd always done the hard work. Yes, there was injuries, and your list is not healthy at times. Um, performances rocketed, but yeah, that's the thing that probably disappointed us the most as a group is that we just weren't consistent in that period of time to be playing finals every year and give ourselves a chance, an opportunity to be competitive and, um, and and be a really good team who can consistently, like a Geelong now, just play finals year in, year out. You're with This Is Your Sporting Life, brought to you by Tobin Brothers Funeral Celebrating Lives. You can visit them at tobinbrothers.com.au. Well, Shane Wowoden, he was rated a 200 to 1 chance to win the Brownlow medal at the start of the 2000 season, but he was about to make a mockery of those odds. You're listening to This Is Your Sporting Life with Sam Edmund for Tobin Brothers Funerals, celebrating lives. Welcome back to This Is Your Sporting Life for Tobin Brothers Funerals, celebrating lives. Hello, we hope you're enjoying this week's edition of This Is Your Sporting Life. We're chatting with former Melbourne and Collingwood midfielder Shane Wowoden. Shane, I read somewhere recently in an interview, you said your favourite half hour of the year happens at the Brownlow Medal when all the previous winners and their partners are invited to gather in your own private room shortly before the votes are counted, pre-COVID, of course. But why is that? Why was that your favourite uh, half hour of the year? What was so special? It's a lot of greatness in one room, obviously. 
Absolutely, yeah. And uh, for me now, the night, uh, you know, it, it's great to be there for um, the players and inducting the, the new player into into the club and to see that moment, absolutely. But exactly right. For me, that half an hour to 40 minutes, having a beer with the greats of the game who, you know, I was introduced to, you know, 21 years ago now um, is a highlight, you know. Pioneers, uh, cha- what I call champions of our game, and uh, it's once a year, unfortunately. We- we'd love to be able to do more, but, you know, just reflecting, um, just catching up, saying good day, seeing how each other is, being in their presence, and for me, that's what it, it's all about. Um, yeah, I'm very grateful and very appreciative of having it around my neck, but um, to be in that room and company with those great men um, uh, has been wonderful. And and they're only just chats just to say good day and see how you're going and, um, and speaking with their partners and whatnot, but uh, it's an exciting time to be involved with that. Yeah, and so prior to the 2000 season, I think you had... Oh, I think you had 12 Brownlow votes on your resume. And on Brownlow Night 2000, you've already got 13 beside your name after eight rounds. When did you start to get a little squirmy in your chair in there at Crown Palladium? Um, probably the back end of the night. Yeah, I think it was 15 or so after round eight. Uh, right. I jumped early. My, my first round one and round two, I, was, I remember my first game of the year. I'd played back pocket on Mark Miranda and then played wing in round two, and then uh, we got an injury, I think, in round three against Sydney at the SCG, um, and I was end up getting put through the midfield in the second half of the game, and I think I had 20 and kicked two in the second half or something like that, and it sort of kick-started and maybe a little bit of belief from the coaching group that I can play as an inside mid and be a midfielder. Um, and then from there, that early parts of the season, really round three to eight or so, it sort of jumped and got really good form. And on the back of that, the team, as a group, we were a really strong midfield and we performed really well. So, um, And like all seasons, you have that... Oh, you don't want to, but you have that mid-season sort of slump where there's a bit of a tension on you, but I just couldn't capture that form. And then I got it at the back end of the year. So um, it probably wasn't until really, I think, the round 21 game against the Cats mm. uh, where I got the three which put me right into contention. And um, I was just fortunate enough that all of, all the stars in the game who were having good, good years, like Cuda, McLeod, West, Foss, Buckley, I think were all up in there. They weren't polling as well when I wasn't, so no one skipped out on the leaderboard. And I just happened to be amongst it at the end and um, was there about to, with, with a couple of rounds to go. Yeah, so the favourites that year were obviously Scotty West, the Bulldogs' ball magnet. Uh, Anthony Kutafidis, you mentioned, was the AFL MVP that year. You mentioned round 21, but the final round, round 22, was something else. So you're on 22 votes, West is 21, and he was expected to poll in the last game. I think he had a game-high disposal tally, but it was a dog's loss. Now, your D's had a win that round, but you had 17 possessions. So West got the one vote to tie you... And then you pulled two to win outright. I mean, what a moment that must have been for you. Yeah, and felt a little bit... Uh, um, I, I felt for Scotty because I knew I had... And it all evens itself out in the, throughout the year where you think you get ones and you should have twos and vice versa. Mm. But, um, yeah, I would have loved to have shared the podium with West. He was a, he was a great man, a great player. And I got to play on West here a couple of times in my career and travel with him to... Ireland for the All-Australian Series that year and effectively just rotated off the ground with him in the midfield rotation. So, uh, yeah, great man. And I'd, I'd, as much as, yeah, it's great to to have the award, I would have loved to have shared it with Westy because um, he certainly deserved it. He was a, he's been a great of the game. But, yeah, I managed to get the two and I, I honestly don't know how I got the two. Maybe it was one of the goals that I did kick in that day. But, yeah, yeah 17, 18, whatever it was... Um, I think Adam Uze starred with five and 30, I think, that day and got the three. But, yeah, we belted West Coast and I got the two, which gave me it out, gave me the award outright. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, it was yeah, pretty exciting. Oh, pandemonium on the night, wasn't it? I, was, I can't imagine you would have had a speech prepared. And wasn't that – you got the old uh, blood nose as well en route to the podium as well, just to make, just to make things a little bit interesting yeah, up to the lectern there. Yeah, like John Longmire was my manager at the time at IMG and – 
before he went to Sydney as a coach. Uh, he did actually say, I want you to prepare a speech, yep. uh, which I did. Yeah. Okay. You never know, he said. So it could be um, it could be your time. It might not be, but just have one just in case. So uh, yeah, what was pandemonium? Uh, I reckon three, two or three rounds out, the cameras were on the table, and I was oblivious to all that. Um, and the and the feeling was just uh, I I probably I wouldn't say regret, but I was a bit uh, I wasn't really humbled in my celebration. I would have thought uh, in how it all is, but that's just stuck there now for life. But <laughs> I could have been a little bit more subdued and just uh, taken it easy. But as a 24, I got caught up in the emotion and celebrated accordingly. And yeah, as I went up and around the tables, I, um, I felt blood streaming from my nose. And I think I may have uh, dripped a couple of drops onto um, Adam Uze's wife's uh, white dress on the way up. So oh, no. You, may hear, me, you, may, you hear me, may hear me sniffling a little bit on stage in my speech. So um, managed to curtail that. But yeah, it was, it was pandemonium. Um, one of the big things, I still remember Neil Danaher's face when I walked around the players' table and um, the the committee table with presidents and mm. board members alike and the coach, I still remember Neil's face. Uh, it was like, like, holy shit, what's just happened? We've got a grand final play in five, in five days. Is this going to uh, distract us and all? That's how I felt he looked. Um, but, yeah, it, it was a great night. It was um, something I was able to celebrate with my teammates and my family and my footy club. Um, not only that night, we had to get a game going in a few days' time, but yeah. um, post-season and reflecting on it. Yeah, well, as you touch on, I mean, it's such an emotional uh, way for someone to have to ride, and yet, as you say, five days later, you've got to play in a grand final against perhaps the most dominant team we've seen in any one season. That was Essendon of 2000. How did you go about getting the emotions back under control fully in, in a short space of time? Yeah, we had... I had to do a few events for the AFL yeah. and, and a few press conferences, which um, it is what it is. But if I had my time again, I, I may do something differently, particularly like for Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, those two days where it is part of your preparation, it, it wasn't the normal. I probably didn't get my own time for my own preparation, getting my head right and physically right until about you know late Wednesday afternoon. Um, but it was part and parcel of being the medalist and it's what you had to do so I did it um, but yeah but once Wednesday afternoon came around and I got rid of all the celebration stuff I was able to just now hone in on the performance and what I need to do for my team game day and what role I had to play and um, you know enjoy and embrace the moment of what uh, the parade day is all about but then when training's on we're on and we've got a job to do. And just in that game the 2000 grand final did you strain at, uh, your hammy early in the game? Yeah, I did. I did it uh, in way through the first quarter. I got tackled by Chris Heffernan in the centre square and felt a little pop. Uh, I'd had a, I'd had some tendonitis uh, of the, of the hamstring for pretty much half the season and a little bit of a modified back end of the year to get me through um, and feel good enough. But I feel felt I lost a lot of power in my, in my hammy and uh, on the tackle where Chris dragged me down, I, I felt a little pop. Um, and lost even, lost even more power. I think I got through uh, another two and a bit quarters, basically on one leg, and then I subbed myself off. Uh, there was a loose ball on the uh, southern side, and James Hurd just ran straight past me really quickly, and mm. I, I just said, no, I'm useless out here for my teammates. So I subbed myself, and that was my day um, pretty early. We were getting belted, but, yeah, I, I just knew after that moment I couldn't have the impact I... I wanted to have, um, just wasn't able to run around and do what I wanted to do. You would play in two grand finals, Shane. Obviously, that loss to Essendon and the 2003 loss to Brisbane when you were at Collingwood. What do you tell people who I'm sure ask from time to time what playing on grand final day is like at the top level? Oh, it's, it's an exciting feeling. It, the, the moment that I, I've always wanted and I play for, and I, I go to grand finals. You know, even now when I'm not playing, is to experience it. I wanted the moment with my teammates with a medal around your neck, standing on the dais all together, just enjoying that moment. And that's the moment that I've always wanted to play for, um, where you get to embrace each other, uh, enjoy the euphoria of what a premiership's all about, knowing the hard work's all been done, 
and uh, that's the moment that I was craving for. Yeah, you, I want to enjoy and get the medal presented to yourself individually, but to have that time where you're celebrating together on the dive is what we play footy for. Um, so, yeah, I was very fortunate enough to play two grand finals, uh, and there's a lot of hard work to get to there. There's, it's a little bit of luck. You need a healthy list. You need to be playing good footy at the right time of the year. Um, but um, seconds is just as good as finishing eighth, I reckon. I, the, the summit was never reached, and unfortunately, you know, that's the one thing that's alluded to me, and um, I'm, I'm most disappointed that I didn't, that didn't get in my footy career. We're talking to Shane Wowoden on This Is Your Sporting Life, thanks to Tobin Brothers Funeral Celebrating Lives. It was the trade that shook the footy world. Shane's move to Collingwood is up after this. You're listening to This Is Your Sporting Life with Sam Edmund for Tobin Brothers Funerals Celebrating Lives. Welcome back to This Is Your Sporting Life for Tobin Brothers Funerals Celebrating Lives. It's been great to have your company here on This Is Your Sporting Life. Thanks to Tobin Brothers Funerals, a family-owned business since 1934. And Shane Wowoden is our guest today. Shane, as we touched on earlier, you played for East Fremantle as a teenager and you were constantly linked to the Fremantle Dockers over the course of your career. Were you ever close to going home? And how many times did they legitimately sound you out? Once. I reckon legitimately sounded me out. Uh, I got a call when I was lying on the beach in Mauritius from Cameron Schwab. I think it was the CEO at Fremantle at that time within that trade period, end of 02. Um, I, I'd always wanted to be a one-club player, and I think most players do. I think it's a little bit harder in the modern game now where... Um, and, and I always felt being loyal to your footy club who gave me the opportunity um, initially was where I wanted to be and play and remain and play your 200 games, become a life member um, of one club. Um, but for me, yeah, it did turn out that way. So the year after the Brownlow, 2001, you sign a new three-year contract halfway through. I think it was July of 2001. Taking you through to 2004 was a three-year deal. You, you played much of the early part of that 01 year, actually. I think it later emerged with a broken back. Is that right, in 01? Yeah, I'd broken a little bone in my back uh, against West Coast. It was the first game I think I'd missed as a player and spent two weeks. I just got a little bump from Phil Matera and... Um, I just thought I'd done some muscle damage, but it ended up being a little a break in my transverse process in the back, and which just put me a couple of weeks on the sideline. Um, yeah, a little bit uncomfortable from that for a couple of weeks, but a month in, I, I was fine. So yeah, um, you just yeah. get to play with injuries. It was my form. Um, as much as you don't want, it, I wasn't fit enough going in. I was still carrying no preseason going in. That hamstring issue was lingering through the whole preseason, uh, which I couldn't shake. I eventually did at, on the eve of the season, but again, it's there's no secret. You need to do a full pre-season to be um, ready for the marathon that you're about to encounter for the rest of the year. So it's not ideal. And it was probably the first year really where I got attention on field where tagging for me was <laughs> going to be the norm. So mm. I had to um, learn what that was all about and embrace that and learn different tricks. Yeah, so for that, for all those reasons, 2001, you couldn't quite replicate your Brownlow form, of course, but you were much better in 2002, but that would prove to be your last year with the Demons. So two years after winning the Brownlow and with two years to run on your contract, it became clear that Melbourne wanted to trade you and they were citing salary cap concerns. Now, ultimately, your destination would be Collingwood in exchange for pick 16, but rewind, how deep was the level of shock for you when, when you heard that a trade was, was going to happen? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, very deep. Uh, cut a little bit, to be honest, uh, because, you know, I yeah, signed a, th- a three-year deal earlier. Didn't really push the club. At the end of the day, the club also signs the deal as well, and it's not players' fault that clubs get put into salary cap um, issues. But, yeah, I, I first heard the news, I think it was on the footy trip in Bali, when um, sort of news started to come through the wires that, this potentially could happen, and it wasn't. It was quite interesting because it started to become the talk of a of around the playing group in the off season. But which happens, I understand, but you never think it's going to happen to yourself. Mm. Um, knowing that there is player movement and, and delistings and and whatnot through that goes that time. Um, so yeah, being away and not really being able to be in control on the ground in Melbourne was was an issue. So um, I just needed to get 
back home and see what was going on and fix it and see what the uh, what the stories are all about. That was the Shane. That was you in Bali when the Bali bombings. That was that year, wasn't it? Obviously. Yeah. Yes, it yeah. was. Yeah, we're all over there. Um, I think with Fremantle and Geelong as well. There were three clubs in Bali at the time. So, as you mentioned, though, then you went overseas again to Mauritius. Is that when the trade actually formally went through, when you're on the beach somewhere in Mauritius, of all places? Yeah, it did. I, I did have a conversation with Neil when I was in Bali, and he said, let's catch up when you get back. And I had 24 hours before I took my partner to um, yeah, Mauritius and South Africa for our own holiday. Um, so, yeah, Neil came over my house and sat in my lounge room for a couple hours, and we had a conversation, and... Yeah, the club was under a bit of financial strain and they needed some assistance and I and I absolutely welcomed it and said, I'll help you out. What do you need? Um, we come to an agreement right then and there on the couch. We shook hands and uh, and Neil said, we'll see you in a couple of weeks of pre-season. So I that, never stepped back in the footy club ever again. So that agreement was that you would take, a, obviously, a pay reduction and would remain at the club? Yep, right. absolutely. So uh, agreed to it. He was very thankful, appreciated. Um, my help. It was a common thing. I, I remember the year before, David Neitz rang me um, and I was holidaying at Rod over here in WA um, because we needed a little bit of a financial assistance because a couple of players we wanted to keep on the list. I think um, we needed some help to keep them about too. And All players at that stage were, were all in to keep um, a couple of really important grand final players that were there. So we're always there to help our playing members. Um, and Neil asked it again and I I welcomed it, not a problem, let's do it. Let's keep our footy club alive and keep our group together because we felt like 2002, um, we're on a special journey. Yeah, we got beaten by Adelaide in the semi, but we, we felt like we were back as a playing group. And um, yeah, we shook hands and I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Look forward to pre-season and that was it. So while you're away and it, the trade goes down, I think your manager then, Liam Pickering, might have called you to say that it was going to happen. And, and Demon fans, well, they flooded Talkback Radio. The club officers were bombarded with complaints. They sent out a letter to members saying they just, uh, according to them, they couldn't put a list together to contend while you were due to be paid more than a million dollars over the two-season period to fulfil the rest of your contract. I think Melbourne even paid a portion of your contract to play for Collingwood. So... You must have been hurt. I think at the time you called it downright rude and, and you did admit that you were you were filthy. Yeah, I, I think I was at uh, East Mountain Footy Club with a Brownlow function um, with all the West Australian Brownlow medalists and I was, uh, had a press conference and, oh, look, that was probably due. One of my regrets back then is that uh, I probably made it a little bit too personal in the media and, um, and, and, and voiced it not the way I should have. Um, should have been a bit more behind closed doors. But, mm. yeah, certainly... Um, at, at that time, I was filthy. I, I didn't want to leave. I was in the Melbourne family. I wanted to enjoy an experience and keep playing with this playing group. And uh, I felt like that was all getting taken away from me at that time. So I held the playing cards because I still had two years to run on my contract. I was probably a bit more filthy the fact that um, the footy club had uh, pushed out their, uh, the contractual stuff, which I wasn't really happy with. But, yeah, so then, yeah, it was, it was just the conversations and the, the constant toing and froing with the footy club and with management whilst I was on holiday. I wasn't just able to, to just enjoy and relax and have a good time. I was constantly on the phone sorting my future out. D- did it take some time to repair the relationship with Neil? Yes, it did. Yep, yep, absolutely. Years. So uh, probably, yeah, and, I, and, I, and we both, we both agree, we're both caught up since on a couple of occasions now and um, we probably didn't really have it all repaired until probably two or three years ago. Uh, how do you reflect so, on, your, on your on your time at Collingwood, Shane, at, at, at the end of it all, which um, you played some good footy at the Pies, it uh, must be said, and as we touched on, you wanted it to go on for longer. But how do you reflect on your, your few years spent at Collingwood? I loved it. Um, you know, those conversations when I was on holidays in O2, you know, I was getting calls from Bark Barmy, Eric, um, a couple more players, um, really wanting me to come across. Um, so there was probably a big say in the final deal where... I could have stayed, but what was getting spoken to me from Melbourne compared to what was happening from the hierarchy at Collingwood were two different things. So I just felt welcomed at Collingwood and um, not welcomed at Melbourne at that time. Um, so I made the choice to, to leave and depart and um, get to the Pies. They just played in the grand final, so I felt like I was going to a strong list and I could learn a little bit more from Mick, um, Nathan in particular as a player too. And Yeah, but... Yeah, fond memories. I got to play another grand final in my first year, so geez, that was exciting. And when you play, we probably argue with the biggest club in the land from a membership base. Um, it, it was pretty special. So that's where I ended up, and I loved it. Yeah, it didn't end well in '05, and mm. 
I understand now as a coach why those decisions are made as players or on players. But, yeah, what a time. Um, I got to experience the highs and lows again of a great club. But I certainly learned a lot. Um, yeah, would have loved to have played another you know, 40 or 50 there and go into my 30s. Um, but it wasn't to be. Yeah, so you delisted after 05. But, I mean, you didn't die wondering. You, you did uh, hold out hope for some time. You tried to get another crack. And was it two pre-season drafts you, you put your name forward in in the end to, to try and get another chance? Yeah, because I, I think I finished second in the Copeland in my second year there. And, yeah. Um, 05, for whatever reason, just didn't only played 15 of the 22 games in 05 and a couple of times get pushed to Williamstown. Um, yeah, I... I trained with the Kangaroos for six weeks that pre-season after 05, which was a great little journey. I, I loved my time there in that training period. Great footy club at an Arden Street. Um, and was hoping for a list spot there. They had it more from a mature age point. Uh, it didn't eventuate, so I came back to Western Australia. And I put 06 in my, in my first year back in the Waffle. I gave it everything. And I was only going to give myself 1% chance that maybe that I, that I could get drafted at 30 when I didn't get picked up at 29. But I gave it everything for one year to put it there, played a good state game, had a good season for the Waffle. Um, and I was preparing and playing as I wanted to get back in the AFL system. And when that didn't happen at the end of 06, um, I said to myself then that I'll just enjoy my maybe last year of Waffle footy and not really know that that's uh, all that my career is done now and I can just enjoy retirement and enjoy a lower level yeah and you went to Brisbane obviously you worked as an assistant there for several seasons before as we said off the top you've moved back to Perth now with a beautiful family what aside from uh, being a father and a husband what else keeps you busy back at home oh yeah full-time work for me which is great in building a career and a pathway outside footy uh, which is really really important and something I'm really excited to be doing now and it's a new journey uh, I'm still involved in coaching. I, I coach a community club in the amateurs here in Western Australia. And um, after Brisbane, where I was a little bit burnt out, I wasn't really um, going to head down in the, the coaching pathway again. But um, I was coached into it. And I've thoroughly enjoyed the community aspect and um, being around players twice a week. A little bit less stress in a coaching box, but, um, but still enjoying around the game and building and developing players. And also coach a... Um, a school team over here in the PSA system in the private school, and uh, which I've thoroughly enjoyed doing. And this was my first year with it. So just um, passing knowledge and teaching the next generation of young players coming through and hopefully they can um, enjoy a long career. If it's not the AFL, it's at, at Waffle level or state level and, uh, and develop those young men. Shane, it's been a pleasure to catch up today. I mean, you were made to wait to get your chance, but, geez, you're more than made up for lost time. You made a brilliant start to your career, and you went on with it too, obviously winning the Brownlow and a Melbourne Best and Fairest in the same season. It is a great-looking resume. Well done on all you achieved, and thanks for joining us. Sam, it's my pleasure, mate. Great to be with you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us also. You've been listening to This Is Your Sporting Life for Tobin Brothers Funerals. Celebrating lives, you can jump online to find them at tobinbrothers.com.au. And we'll catch you in the next time we celebrate the life of another sporting icon. Podcasts don't need insurance, but tradies do. Imar Insurance, the tradies mate, has been insuring Australian tradies for over 35 years. With competitive premiums, instant cover and no paperwork. That's the Imar Insurance difference. Call an expert now on 13 Imar. Now the tradies mate, that's Imar.